Gentlemen and audience, uh, as you know, the leaky bucket report, the, the chamber identified corrections, Medicaid and public employee health insurance as areas of state spending growing much faster than the overall budget and uh, recommended a, a number of policy options that they would suggest to curtail spending uh, in these areas. And as you also know, uh, the Pew Center on States uh, reported that Kentucky has been putting people in prison faster than uh, any other state in the nation uh, at a rate uh, that leads the nation despite our relatively uh, low crime rate, citing um, enhanced and overbroad criminal penalties as one of the possible reasons. Uh, the budget uh, this year authorized the Pew Center to come to Kentucky to study the problem in depth. So uh, given those facts, uh, the, the likely recommendations that they possibly will make uh, is it politically feasible for the General Assembly to revise the penal code and expand the use of alternatives to incarceration, especially given the tendency of some prosecutors to object to some of the measures that might be perceived as lessening penalties? Mr. President. Well, thank you for calling on me first. And <laughs> it's a pleasure. Uh, some of my clients would say that I have done a lot for the prison population as a defense counsel down through the years, but, <laughs> but ne never, uh, as a matter of fact, I'm meeting tomorrow uh, with some folks from the Pew Foundation, and actually the Pew Foundation funding is something the speaker and I and the leadership agreed to. There's an organization uh, uh, that is associated with the Council of State Governments, and I'm uh, proud to be the national chairman of the Council of State Governments this year, and about 13 or 14 states have been uh, chosen by the Justice Center, which is associated with the Eastern Regional District of the Council of State Governments. And there, it's a really sought after study that Pew is doing to come in and do an analysis, an in-depth analysis of the number of people you have incarcerated, why they're incarcerated, and what sort of parole, probation system, pretrial diversions, well, what sort of community uh, correction systems you have in place, drug courts, mental health courts, the entire spectrum of those sort of things are going to be studied. So I think that although you might be able to presume what the studies might find, it's a little early to indicate. I'm going into it w with an open mind, and, and I think that we'll get some real solid, uh, some real solid advice uh, from these folks uh, from, from the Justice Foundation who will come in. They've gone into Florida, Texas, some other states like that. But we incarcerate, and you know, I look at the numbers, and I think the speaker will agree with this. It's really hard to realize the numbers that we're talking about. You know, nationally, Capital Ideas, which is a publication of the Council of State Governments, um, has a document, and, and every time I look at it, you know, I'm just amazed is that in the United States of America, uh, among the male population, one in 105 uh, individuals is behind bars in, in, in 2008. In Kentucky, um, you know, it was like one in 30-something uh, people have been, you know, behind bars and the numbers that are under supervision. And in, in the minority population, uh, it's, it's, it's a much, much higher in, in Hispanic and, and black men and obviously in, uh, in white men, it's, it's, it's a lot higher. And even the number of women that are going to prison incarcerated for various things, a lot of them are what traditionally have been referred to as the victimless crimes that have to do with um, uh, drugs, not only methamphetamine, prescription drugs, all the things that are associated with that thing. And it's a tremendously terrible problem in the recidivism rate that we have when these people uh, return back to community uh, severely damaged and able uh, to become employed. And uh, what we're doing about it as far as the number of Class D felons and the enhancements we have are something that we are going to have to look at. And I don't think um, you talk about the political will. I was recently on a panel uh, talking about this issue in New York uh, at the Council of State Governments annual meeting. I don't think it's a conservative or a liberal issue or a Democrat or conservative issue. It, it's, it's a matter of humanity uh, as far as I'm concerned and whether it's acceptable uh, to have the number of people incarcerated without any hope of uh, being able to return to a productive life that we have and uh, how the system uh, uh, doesn't seem to, uh, to be able to 
give the sort of uh, emphasis into rehabilitation, drug rehabilitation, and that sort of thing that we'd like for it to. So I'm, I'm open-minded about it, and I think it's something that we have to take a look at because of the cost. Uh, we know we're going to have to protect the population from violent individuals. But right now, we don't always have enough room to keep violent individuals <laughs> as long as we ought to because of the pressures. Mr. Speaker? Well, let me uh, speak to that as a former prosecutor, as Attorney General. Uh, we actually engaged in a study within Chief Justice Lambert and Justice Keller and Lieutenant Governor Pence at that time and some others about uh, this whole issue. Uh, there was a focus on what we call the PFO, uh, persistent felony offenses that Doc Professor Larson, who had written part of the criminal code, the biggest part of the criminal code many years ago, and he wanted to point the blame and say that that's the reason we have such a high rate of incarceration in Kentucky. Uh, the problem became when uh, you try to do some recommendations and the prosecutors who use that as a tool uh, to, uh, in, in the court cases, violently objected. And then everybody sort of took a step back and said, well, we can't do it. I mean, the Chief Justice, Justice Keller, even Lieutenant Governor, everyone sort of took a step backwards. I think there's a way to do it. Um, and I think that uh, we can get the prosecutorial community to buy into it. And it's through this GPS monitoring system. As most of you may have heard, Amanda's law, Amanda's law will go into effect uh, day after tomorrow. It relies upon the GPS monitoring device that uh, can be utilized for a number of things and is currently being utilized actually in, in, uh, in this city and in Lexington and some other places uh, currently to monitor either pretrial or, or post-conviction uh, offenders. But the telltale piece of evidence to me as far as uh, this issue is concerned is when Ray Larson, who is the uh, Commonwealth Attorney in Fayette County, and those of you who know Ray Larson know he's uh, very tough, very hard-nosed, very law and order uh, prosecutor, is a strong proponent for the use of GPS monitoring because he says, and the President touched on it uh, a bit ago, that a prosecutor's job, law enforcement's job, is to keep your home safe and your community safe. These devices uh, that are being utilized in, Jer in Fayette County right now, um, when there's a crime, Ruth Ann, uh, in a place in Fayette County, uh, say the Broadway uh, convenience store gets robbed tonight.